ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you all experience in this uh, Chaos Computer Labyrinth, this, uh, one can meet uh, really interesting people here, and you all did, presumably. What I did is actually meeting people with all kinds of colored hats. I see some hats here, uh, green, red, orange, whatever. But this is another kind of hat this guy is wearing. He's wearing the color, color of money. Uh, <laughs> money is evaporating quite rapidly in my pockets, I, uh, <laughs> I experience. But he's going to show us how to trade places. So trading places, sorry to introduce you like that, Mark. But uh, he's used to talk about blockchain technology, Bitcoining and whatever. And now he's helping banks to get an uh, understanding about modern technology, currently focusing on that kind of topics like blockchaining. So he will explain us how international money transfers work. Yes. So in a way, Mark van Kuyk is going to show us the money. <laughs> Please give him a welcome applause. Light the fuse, put it in play. Thank you, Peter, and also thank you all for having me and being here. Uh, one thing you said, the money is evaporating from your wallet. A lot of people are saying it ends up in banks and they take all our money. But this talk is not about the politics and whether banks are good or bad or those things. We're going to look into the te technicalities. Now, before I begin, banks have departments and there are all different functions for departments. One of them is the payment department, but others are like uh, lending, mortgages, uh, foreign exchange. Those I'm not going to focus on. I'm only going to focus on the payment department. What's interesting to think about the different departments is that they have a different risk profile. And what I've noticed in the banks where I've been is all the payment departments are very risk averse. They rather make less money and not lose anything than make a lot of money and put a lot of risk. Uh, this may be different in different departments. I've not seen them. I've heard a lot of stories, both inside and outside banks. One of the things that is very interesting, very important I, when you're going to speak with people in banks is to understand the concept of a financial model. And if there is somebody here from a blockchain startup, try to learn those. It will really help you connect with people in banks. So to introduce this concept, I'm going to look at the most simple kind of payment you can do, and it is called a book transfer. Uh, and this is happening when in one bank there are two clients and one wants to send funds to another. Now I'm going to use real banks' names, most of them in the Netherlands, but the examples here uh, I have just made up. Uh, and in this financial model, you will see boxes, and every box is a financial institution. It has a name or a label. So in this case, it is ABN AMRO, one of the Dutch banks. Uh, and then you can have a couple of accounts. Uh, you will see there will always be at least two, otherwise there is very little you can do. And an account looks like a T-shape. On the right side, you will see whenever money is taken out of the account, we call it a debit, and on the left side, whenever money is put into account, we call it a credit. So what you see here is a transfer of 500 euros, I didn't state that, but let's say euros, from Alice to Bob. This is the simple one. Now there are a couple of rules in financial models, and one of them is when you sum up everything on the left side and you sum up everything on the right side within a single box, it should be equal. So whenever we take 500 euros from an account, we have to put in 500 euros somewhere else. We cannot invent money in this way. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's make it a little bit more difficult. We have now two financial institutions. Bob is no longer at ABN AMRO, he's now moving to ING. Um, and we still want to transfer 500 euros, but we cannot move funds across a, a, a box in the easy way. So we need to think of a way to do this. Well, one th way you could do this is introduce a new account in ING system, which is for ABN AMRO. So ABN could hold funds at ING. And then, and then when Alice says, I want to send Bob 500 euros, ABN could pay it out of its ING account to Bob but we need to make something on the top side too, so that would be a flip 
account uh, where the money from Alice is going to. This is, by the way, not how it works exactly with ABN and ING, um, but it is to introduce the concepts. These two accounts are now linked together, and they should always mirror each other, and therefore we also call them mirror accounts. So let's rename it. On the bottom you see ABN Amro's account at ING, and on the top we see a mirror account, and um, different banks write it in different ways, but one of the notations I've seen is you just prefix M dash, so that's what I'm going to do here. It's important, it's a new rule for a financial model that mirror accounts are always mirrored. If they are not, there is a discrepancy, and this also sometimes happens in uh, reality, so uh, people are going to be involved to fix the mistakes, but when you're going to do it, it on a theoretical level, whenever you have some product, you will have to demonstrate that everything will work out, so this rule must be satisfied. Now, in reality, as I've already said, this is not how it works with ABN and ING. And there's one interesting reason. Banks are risk averse. So why would ABN put money in ING? If ING goes bankrupt, ABN will lose money. They don't want to. Still, we want to do it in this way. And we need to send this 500 euros from Alice somewhere. Now, one option you could do is introduce a bank a different kind of bank, one that everybody really trusts. And this is like a central bank, for example. <laughs> now, um, I'm going to introduce the European Central Bank Target 2 system here. And Target 2 is, um, okay, I'm going to show you a little later, but it is an RTGS. Um, here we are moving central bank money, and uh, as a c customer, as a, a person or a normal company, you cannot hold an account at a central bank. Only financial institutions can do so. So here, ABN AMRO has an account at the central bank, ING has one, uh, and now we can make the story work here. We debit 500 euros from Alice's account, we credit it on the mirror that ABN has in its book, books, we sent a message to the ECB, we're saying, okay, there is a payment from Alice to Bob, um, I need to transfer 500 euros from my account to ING, so this is what the ECB is going to do, and then a message is sent to ING, hey, uh, you have incoming uh, a payment, 500 euros have been credited to your account, please make sure that Bob will receive this. Now, those green arrows are messages, so we need some kind of interbank messaging. And this is where SWIFT plays a role. You may have heard SWIFT in the news. Um, SWIFT uh, has been established a long time ago in, in the time that we didn't work the way we work like now. Um, but for payments, they have two important, very important um, roles. The first one is they offer a communication network. And nowadays, part of this is going over the internet. Um, but back in the days, it, this wasn't the case, of course. Uh, and it looks a bit like this. So ABM wants to send a message to the ECB. And first of all, you will need some address. And for this, we have bank identifier codes, BICs. Um, they are eight or 11 digits long. And they have a certain structure. The first four digits are the bank code, so in the case of, case of ABN AMRO, we see at the left bottom, it is ABN A. Then we have two digits for the country, NL, and two digits for the location, A2, which is Amsterdam. On the right, you see that ING is also in Amsterdam. On the top, you see the ECB, ECBF, which is uh, located here in Germany, and FF is for Frankfurt. Now, ABN AMRO sends a message to SWIFT, SWIFT stores the message and forwards it to ECB. Um, the ECB will acknowledge this, uh, so despite, uh, or unless how it is on the internet, where we have a best effort model for messages, here we actually do acknowledge uh, everything, and when a message uh, doesn't arrive, it will retransmit, etc. SWIFT will also archive the message, so whenever in the future there is a dispute, Swift can say, okay, here are all the messages that have been sent at those times, it has been acknowledged, etc. so we can reconstruct what has happened and what would then legally be the thing that, uh, should, be, that should be. And the second role of Swift is now we have this network and we can send messages, is what do those messages look like? 
So they create standards, the message definitions. And nowadays we have two types, um, commonly used in some places, MT and MX. And MT is the old style, which stands for message types. And there are a lot of them, they all have an identifier of three digits. So we have, for example, MT103, which is a customer payment. MT202 is a payment from an institution to another institution, when uh, not specifically for a client. MT910 to inform another bank that his account has been debited. Uh, uh, there are a lot more. Um, then MX, because we are going forward in time, so we need XML. Um, <laughs> is a, a new standard, also an ISO standard actually. And people who may in, um, uh, communicate with banks um, may know, for example, pain one uh, and those kinds of, but those are also used between banks. So let's see some example. MT103 is a credit transfer for a single, uh, a single credit transfer for customers. So where actually clients of banks are involved. Here's an example, we have five blocks. Um, the most interesting block is block four, it contains all the information, and it is kind of like a tag value pair. So for example, we have uh, the tag 32A, and it states that the first six digits are the date. So on 26th of May in the year 2000, we have sent US dollars with the amount of 1,101.50. Uh, th this is the amount that is actually moving between banks. Uh, 33B is the amount that was ordered. You see a difference of 20 US dollars, that's the charge. On, on the bottom you see 71F, there are some charges. Um, let's not go too deep into this, but this states we're sending funds from here to there, and this is all banks need to figure this uh, things out. Then there is block five, and it contains a message authentication code, so it is not easy to change those, to, to, so we can detect transmission errors. Now moving to XML, um, we need new names, of course, and we need a smaller font. <laughs> <laughs> but for the rest, this is um, an example. So here again, there is an envelope uh, on, at the top, for those who can read it, um, stating this is going from this institution to this institution, and there is a content uh, which says there is one transfer in this XML file, uh, and it has some details. Um, so uh, this is the example we were looking at, um, but there is, there is something about this. I told uh, before, the Target 2 system is called an RTGS, which stands for Real-Time Gross Settlement System. And here we are transferring, like, some people in banks are actually calling real money. I don't know what they call the money that I deposit in my account then, but <laughs> this is central bank money. Yeah, Venus. Um, but, and, Transaction in Target 2 is quite expensive, and uh, uh, banks normally uh, do transactions uh, up to hundreds or sometimes thousands transactions per second. Target 2 cannot handle this if all of Europe will, do, uh, will be transferred in this way. And at the bottom you actually see the pricing options for Target 2 transactions. The cheapest a single transaction can be transferred is for 12 and a half cents. And I know for sure that I can send someone a euro without paying 12 and a half cents. So there is something else going on here. What's actually happening for low value payments is we're going to net batches. So the example I showed just before, if, we, if a company sends 10 million to another company, we call it a high value payment, we do it in that way. What, we're not, what I'm not going to show is low value payments. Now it works like this. And at the bottom are the four uh, largest retail banks in the Netherlands, ABN AMRO, Rabobank, SNS Bank, and ING. And during the day, people are sending in payment orders. So with an app or with a, um, through the internet, you're saying, I want to transfer money. Now, let's say again, LSS at ABN AMRO. ABN sends to a clearinghouse a message saying, okay, this is, uh, there is a payment. And one of the clearing houses we have in Europe is EBA Step 2. Another one, uh, mostly in the Netherlands, is Equins. Um, they collect all those payments and they just put them on a heap. And then, periodically, a process starts. And this is the settlement cycle. So now we have from all banks a list of payments they want to do. 
What we can now do is we can net it all together. So let's say there are a lot of payments from AB and AMRO going to the other banks, and they all sum up to an amount of, say, 800,000 euros. And incoming are payments for the amount of 1 million euros. Now, the net result is that ABN should receive 200,000 euros. So there will be one transaction in target two, just redistributing things according to all the individual payments we have seen in this cycle. So EBA, in this case, um, prepares all this, sends information back to all the banks, saying, these are your incoming payments. So now it, ING knows Bob is going to be paid, but ING is not yet going to pay Bob at this point in time. EBA sends a message to Target2 saying, this is how I want to redistribute the funds. And Target2 sends to all the banks, hey, you have an incoming payment or you have an outgoing payment. So th there is a credit or a debit on your account. And now ING sees, I have done those transactions, I have those incoming transactions, and this is what happened on target two. It will compute the same sum and see that the, the net amount is equal to what happens at target two, and then they say, okay, I'm now very certain I have received the money, central bank money, so now I'm going to pay out Bob. So it looks a bit like this. The slides are going to be on the website, by the way, so if you want to study it more in depth, then you can take your time. But there is one more thing I introduce on the, in here. In ABN, you see a suspense account. Some banks know I call it a wash account um, or a control account, but I like the term suspense, so banks use different names for the same thing, very interesting. So. When Alice sends this payment order, saying I want to send this 500 euros to Bob, the money is taken out of her account, so it's debited there. And we need to put it somewhere, is one of those rules. So let's put it in this suspense account. At this point in time, Alice has no longer a claim on ABN AMRO for this 500 euros. But also ABN AMRO knows I cannot just use those 500 euros for anything, because it is in the suspense account and it's not in their own account. Then, when the settlement cycle happened, step B, money is, moves in, uh, is moved in the ECB Target 2 system, and all the banks, and then in their turn, will receive notifications and can perform the final transfers, and they can either go out of a suspense account or out of the mirror account. <coughs> so, and I'm already uh, going to the final part here, but this is also a more difficult part, so it will take a bit of time. How does thing, do things look in an international cross-currency system? So, let's make it very interesting. First of all, the, the world is huge, and there are a lot of banks, so we need a routing system, a routing table. Back in 1987, this was the routing table. And every year a new almanac came out where you can show these are the banks. This bank has a relationship with this bank. The relationships I'm going to show you, I have just um, invented them yesterday, so these are, those are probably not the ones that are in real life. But for example, here it could say ABN has a dollar relationship, a US dollar relationship with Citibank or with JP Morgan. Um, this bank in Brazil has this kind of relationship with this American bank, and then the sending bank has the task, and at this time it was like flipping pages, finding a route how you could make sure the funds ends up in the, end last, in the last bank, beneficiary bank. So let's, let's look at an example here, and what we're going to do, I've now moved Bob out of Europe, moved him all the way to Brazil, and he's now no longer transacting in euros, but he has an account in Brazilian real. Alice is still at ABN AMRO and has an account in euros. Now, Alice wants to send Bob a payment, and for a payment we need a currency, and for this payment, um, let's pick US dollars, um, and we want to send 600 US dollars. So the first thing that happens is ABN AMRO has to somehow decide an amount of euros to take out of Alice's account. So we have an exchange rate, and ABN AMRO is, is going to choose. Another option could have been that ABN AMRO doesn't do US dollars, so it's first doing a euro payment to a different bank, uh, maybe a larger bank, uh, who can then do a foreign exchange. And then ABN AMRO upfront doesn't even know how, to, how much to debit 
Alice's account. So this is a, a, you see here, this is a complex thing starting to hear, but let's not go dive into that thing. So 500 euros are taken out of Alice's account and needs to be credited to some other account. Now what happens in this case is ABN AMRO is going to actually uh, um, increase their position in euros. So the euros are now going to belong, are actually owned by ABN AMRO, and in return is going to take out, a decrease their US dollar position. So Alice is actually selling euros to ABN AMRO to buy back US dollars. Uh, but those euros and US dollars need to be somewhere. So in, in the, you don't see here where the euros are, but probably in the Target 2 system. That's a different account, but we don't even need to touch it because in Target 2 we don't need to move euros. We're selling them to ABN AMRO. But US dollars, ABN AMRO cannot have an account at the Federal Reserve, the central bank in uh, the US, because they don't have a banking license in the US. So they need to store it somewhere else. Well, in this case, they're going to store it in a commercial bank in the US. Let's say JP Morgan. As I said, I just invented this relationship yesterday. So ABN, uh, JP Morgan has an USD denominated account in the name of ABN AMRO. Um, and we need to move 600 euros from there to Banco J. Safra, which is a Brazilian bank I yesterday googled. And, uh, and we need to make the thing match again, so we need to mirror it. And if you do it in that way, it will all line up pretty easily. Taking out, the, so debiting the position of ABN AMRO and USD, crediting the mirror account of JP Morgan. And the other side, the mirror must be flipped, so ABN AMRO is debited, Banco J. Sefra is credited in US dollars, message is sent to Brazil, um, they are debiting their mirror, it's a mirror, crediting something, well in this case their USD position, so now what's going to happen here is USD is sold to Banco J. Sefra and both are Brazilian reals. And this happens by Bob actually, but it's all hidden in the process. So 2,000 Brazilian reals are debited from uh, the position in uh, the uh, BRL position and credited to Bob. And now Bob has received the funds. This may seem pretty difficult, so again, the slides are online if you want to walk through the process to, to un really understand it. But there are a couple of things that are interesting here. Um, in ABN AMRO, and actually everywhere in Europe, we have now I-bands, and they're all standardized and automated, and there is a checksum in there, so a lot of mistakes can be prevented up front. In the US and in Brazil, we have different systems. So, well, there is some manual thing in here, and if the beneficiary account number is wrong, money may be moved from uh, the, in JP Morgan from ABN to Banco J. Safra and message is forwarded and in the end they see, I don't know where to put this money. So a message goes back, which can be, is, which is also an empty message, MT199 uh, if I'm correct, uh, saying, okay, I don't know what to do with this money. Now it goes back to ABN AMRO and a manual process is started. Manual process takes time, an investigation takes time and it, it costs a lot for banks. So this is actually the reason, or one of the reasons, why international payments are expensive. A lot of problem errors go on in there. Those must be corrected. And a bank can choose to either charge those customers that make the mistakes, but not always you can really identify them. So another thing is, well, we know the amount of mistakes we make. We have a team, it costs us this much. Let's spread it out over all the internet pa international payments and just say, sending money from uh, Europe to, to Brazil is like 15 euros, and then it kind of works out. And that's what most banks are then doing. And another thing here is, ABN AMRO is in a Euro time zone, Europe's time zone. JP Morgan is in a different time zone. Banco J. Sefra is uh, in a different time zone, more aligned with JP Morgan, but Sometimes it therefore, when a message is sent to another bank and their central bank is not open or they themselves are not open, it just sits there waiting for the sun going in their direction. <laughs> so this is one of the reasons why it takes time. 
Other things is, for example, now there is a US bank in the middle of a payment from a Europe client to a Brazilian client. And the US banks uh, have very stringent uh, controls here. They must not be in the path of any terrorist money, for example. So JP Morgan may decide for some reason to delay this, this transaction so they can figure out whether Bob is actually a good customer. <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of things that are adding in delays and in costs in the way we do banking right now. Um, this is my most uh, 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 complex example. If you want to see more complex examples, um, just come by afterwards. I don't have them here, but maybe we can send them later on. Sometimes it's fun to look at. Um, but think again, banks are risk averse when it goes to the payment departments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for the world without blockchain. I hope we're moving fast. Are there questions here in this audience? Yes, here. Sir, you're the first one. Take your chance. Thank you for your talk. My question is, why does Abian Ambro do the... Uh, okay. Why does Abian Ambro do this uh, hook? Uh, via an American bank. Uh, I think Amy and Ambro is not that small of a bank and Brazil is not that small of a country, so why does, uh, doesn't Amy and Ambro <laughs> does, uh, open account at a Brazilian commercial bank and do with them what they did with Morgan, but yeah. avoiding the dollars? It's a very good question and the real answer here is I invented those relationships. Ah. Okay. <laughs> but to go into a little bit more uh, subtlety, um, for a bank to keep this relationship open, they, uh, it costs them money. So it depends a lot on how much transactions there are going to be with Brazil, for example. Um, it costs them money for a couple of reasons, and one of them is, in fact, they don't like keeping money in another commercial bank. So during the year, they do continuous checks on how is your liquidity position, how is your solvency position, and maybe we want to lower the amount of money we keep in your bank, or maybe we accept a higher amount. So there's a lot of work going on in there. In the past, you saw that there were a lot more relationships, and what you see now in banks, especially since in Europe, we are now one single region, you see banks like to decrease the amount of relationships they have, and as a result, concentrate money in a couple of large banks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you looked at uh, how it works, for example, to move other kinds of assets like stocks, real estate. Is it a similar process or is it completely different? Because that's also a very popular application of blockchains. Yeah, um, the answer is uh, no, I haven't. And the reason is, um, the most things I'm involved with, uh, involved in with banks right now is with payments. Uh, so for the others, I do know a bit what is going on, but not in really in depth. We have a question there from out of space. How does this all work with uh, PayPal or credit cards? Uh, the payments uh, there are usually instant. Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually the payment is not instant. What, what is instant is the promise that you will be paid. <laughs> and this Now I have I know one thing they call it cards and it's a, de a separate department and it works completely different. I have to ask around a bit what I have understood about credit cards. Um there is some uh, at, at some uh, point in time there are still obligations. Um so one of the questions I haven't yet an answer for myself, for example, if, if I have a uh, credit card at ING and I want to pay someone in the US, what happens when ING goes bankrupt before the money actually goes out? Uh, that's one of the questions I hoped I could have answered today, but um, not yet, maybe next year. Okay, I have a question here, this gentleman in the white shirt. Um, why don't they just use the central bank, you know, like, uh, like the European central bank is having a connection with the American central bank and so they use those for exchange? That's also a good question. And in general, uh, the European central bank 
has a couple of roles in society. And one of them is uh, target two, and another one is um, um, having oversight over the euro area, but they have nothing to do with US dollars. And whenever you touch that, you're in, uh, actually importing new risks that you don't like. And the central <coughs> banks, we want to trust them, and they should therefore be a little trustworthy, actually, and not do anything that may be a risk. Okay, this gentleman here in the back. Uh, concerning the security with SWIFT transfers, there has be, have been recently uh, some uh, some kind of virtual haste. Uh, for example, I think in Bangladesh a couple of months ago. Could you elaborate a bit on uh, how how they uh, how they uh, how it works actually and how they uh, try to to fix it? Security. Yeah. O only a little bit. Um, he has NDAs to sign. You know, he's working in the financial sector. <laughs> Bunches of NDAs. That's also true. Um, but another thing, um, a lot of people don't know everything. Uh, actually, nobody knows everything in this sector. So you have to network your way to the knowledge you want to know. And if you need the knowledge for your work, you can. You have a reason to do so. And otherwise, you do it in your spare time or whatever. Anyway, uh, what happened with Bangladesh and whatever, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, about security in general, the messages are... Some messages are signed, and it depends on the message type. And I found find they have a really interesting choice why some messages are signed. I, I still don't know the reason. For example, the MT103 is signed, which I believe is, is a good thing. Um, but uh, some banks, for example, choose to only credit the beneficiary account when they receive the MT103 and an MT910 saying, we have received funds in another commercial bank, for example. But the 910 is not signed. So they wait for two messages, one of them that can be faked. And I was like, then why wait for this message? Um, they don't know the answer. The people I could ask don't know the answer. So um, it's that's a all I can do misty, for you. It's a mystical financial world there, filled up with trust. Huh? A bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I don't know if I trust this guy. There's a question from out of space again. I wouldn't, by the way. No, I know. <laughs> Why can't uh, the international uh, money transfer system be better automated uh, to make uh, the costs uh, less? Well, actually, that's one of the reasons why banks are looking for blockchain. They also see this as expensive and error prone. And blockchain is this magical thing, right? <laughs> so. Yes, they're investigating, and um, the Holy Grail. that's all I can say today. Okay, this gentleman here is queuing since a long time. Yeah. So you said for uh, transfer between two banks in different time zones, taking time because sometimes waiting for acknowledgement till the sun come up or something, why is this process not automated? So sending message, hacking back, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually depends on the banks that are involved. So... Um, for example, ING wants to be a 24-7 bank, but they depend on other banks. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, for example, there are also banks that haven't automated a lot. So if those, one of those is in the path, by definition, it takes time. But there are also other delay factors than only time zone or opening hours of banks. But Thanks. Okay. Gentlemen there in the back, please. A question about your personal experience. Why do banks always say, hey, we want blockchains when it seems like they actually only want more international standardization? Or do you think they want to subvert the central authorities with some peer-to-peer -peer technology? Okay, I question. cannot talk for all banks why they want something. Um, but what I have seen is they're interested in the technology. There is a lot of talk and hype about it in the media and in conferences and everywhere. So they're like, okay, this is something important. And also one which I find very interesting, a lot of billions of dollars have been invested in blockchain startups, so it must be important. So let's also invest some more. <laughs> Follow the money was the message, so, isn't it? But okay, but besides that reasoning, um, uh, most banks I'm involved with are actually trying to understand the technology and a lot of ideas have already been scraped. They say, okay, blockchain is not a fit in here. Um, so they're actually doing a real job in understanding this, this thing. This, you have a question? Yeah. Good, shoot. Um, <laughs> how can a, a bank like Revolut uh, let their customers get money all over the world in every currency for free? How, sorry, how can? 
the band, uh, there's a new band called Revolut. And okay. you can have a credit card from them. I have a credit card and can, I can get money all over the world in every currency for, for free. Okay. So how is that possible? Uh, quite probably you get it for free, but the bank is paying for it or their investors. Yeah, that's true as well. Okay. So, mm. um, for example, I, um, in the Netherlands you have a payment system called Ideal and you pay for a transaction. It's mostly used for internet payments. But lately banks are uh, building apps or functionality so you can send an Ideal link to someone else as a consumer and they don't charge for it. But banks still have to pay the other banks. And that's, they're paying for it because they want the publicity or they want a certain image or whatever. Also think about, you can get money out of an ATM for free, but those very secure devices, which has a lot of manpower and man hour involved, they cost money. So you as a customer are just a cost center and not a profit center for a bank. So most things customers or retail customers do at banks don't make them real money. Or, not, or profits at least. Banks are a little bit providing umbrellas uh, when the sun is shining, of course. The moment the first yeah. raindrop falls, <laughs> there goes your umbrella. That's yeah, my yeah. experience. Please, sir. So you said that a lot of costs uh, happen when a um, transaction fails, right? When this error message is sent back and it's manually cleared. And I'm wondering, I mean, these could be solved with modern communication protocols and are banks working on a system to anticipate the result of sending this old ancient uh, MT message when they know that it will fail? Yeah, a, a little bit yes, but one of the things here is also standardization. As long as everybody talks in the same, uh, for example, uh, format of account numbers, then things are easier. And that's one of the things that has happening, is happening in Europe, standardize everything. Before SEPA and IBANs, the Netherlands had a different system than Belgium and a different one than in Luxembourg. And all the countries had their own thing. So that is actually why SEPA is there, to standardize what's going on in this region. Now, one of the parts of SEPA is, for example, IBAN. And other countries are now looking into, can we also incorporate IBAN just to lower the amount of errors that we have because of this reason. And of course there are more reasons, but standardization is a very important thing before you can actually automate it. Sir, here at the right side, you have a question or you're just yep. waiting um, for the bus? Okay. <laughs> the, um, the international um, transfers, is there um, a protocol, a standardized protocol, which each bank must follow and who develops it? and Uh, can I can I open a bank and say, oh no, um, I have my own protocol, and or, or a region China maybe says, no, we think we can do it better, and yeah, I, I, I would be very interesting to try, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the standards are um, as long. The most important thing is that two banks that have a relationship also have a standard. Now. One of the most nice thing is that you can buy standard software for banks if you want to start your own bank. So some protocols have been implemented, like the MT uh, defined by Swift. So that becomes a standard in that, that way. So it's not a standard because of law, but it's a standard because, well, it it's, makes things easier to do things the same way. You had that experience you uh, told me about uh, considering to start a Bitcoin bank then, wasn't it? So yes, if you want to talk more about this, do this after this show. Yeah. Uh, we have some other questions. Please. Hello, you've been talking about irregularities in this, let's call it money routing system, I guess then. And you've been saying that manual work is being involved in resolving these issues. Do you know anything about the social relationships between bank personnel around the globe? Or how are these things being resolved? Are there people involved who know each other? How do they know each other? I actually have no idea. I have seen uh, an example of a message where one bank sends to another bank and it doesn't say names of, of people. It's just like regarding MT message with this uh, identifier, if this is going on. And so, yeah, you could automate it, you could say. But, but then the banks have to trust each other, vice versa. 
about well, the claims that are being made, right? And so well, maybe maybe not on stabilized? this level. Maybe not on this level. But uh, yes, when there is a relationship, you need to trust each other, and specifically in one direction, because one bank has money in the other. The other way around, the trust could be a little uh, less. Uh, but whenever you are sending a message saying this is uh, going wrong, that message is most normally signed. And then whatever is in the message is therefore legally binding. There is also, by the way, a non-signed uh, chat message, and this is not used for this functionality. So whenever something goes wrong there, then you first have to set up a relationship, and that's also difficult. So therefore, sometimes you see the message flowing back to, in the same route, but a different direction. Okay, I have, uh, personally, I have one last question for you there. Can, can, we, can we talk about uh, the revolving door principle as well in the banking uh, slash Bitcoining industry? Like, okay, I, I don't certain know. certain levels <laughs> like the government in America is happening currently, for instance, to yeah, the well, revolving door where people first start working at financial sector and then in, in, in the governmental sector, in this case, Bitcoining and banking. It's a good question, and I know a lot of people who works in banks or worked in banks and are getting interested in Bitcoin or blockchain. Um, uh, I know very little <coughs> amount of people that go in the other round, and I even don't know one who is really doing a revolving door kind of action. Uh, uh, okay, so this is the first one. Voila! Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.